Hello, everyone. We'll start in just about a minute or two. There's Dr. Megan Heron, veterinary behaviorist, right over there. And we're going to talk about the book, this book, Decoding Your Cat. See, I come with props. Isn't that great? <laughs> and isn't it great that the Win Feline Foundation is supporting this? Because well, here's a quiz question for you. More, and Dr. Heron, you're not allowed to answer the question. And we're going to give away, by the way, a copy of the book has nothing to do with this quiz question. I'm just tap dancing because we have like 30 seconds before we start. And I want to give people an opportunity to join. But this ties in. The number one reason why cats die. What do you think it is? Kidney disease, cancers, heart disease. Uh, I began a fund at the Wooden Feline Foundation called the Ricky Fund to support studies for feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Most common heart disease in cats, is that it? No, number one reason is behavior. And the number one behavior issue in cats is what we sometimes call inappropriate elimination. And therefore, Dr. Heron's talk today, life-saving, quite literally. And there's lots of information about it, much more than what Dr. Heron can talk about uh, in a limited time that we have here in this book. Uh, Decoding Your Cat, authored by Dr. Heron and her colleagues uh, at the Mer American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. Uh, by the way, if you're interested, dacvd.org, that's the website. Wind Feline Foundation welcomes you. The Wind Feline Foundation for 52 years has been supporting funding for cat health studies. So it's safe to say, for you veterinary professionals watching, and welcome, uh, Everything you know about cats was once funded by WIN, or at least in part funded by WIN. Uh, long before I joined the board of directors, which was at this point, I think about 15 years ago or so. Uh, so whether we're talking about behavior issues, uh, whether we're talking about whatever we know about heart disease and cats that I mentioned, whether we're talking about feline infectious peritonitis or FIP, can you believe that WIN Feline Foundation in a very direct, indirect way, had everything to do with remdesivir. Remdesivir is the drug you've heard a lot about uh, for COVID-19, uh, the first drug approved to treat patient, human patients with COVID-19. That drug or an identical drug was actually used to treat cats with feline infectious peritonitis, which is a form, of course, of a coronavirus. I know, it's very confusing, but it's amazing, really, that us little old folks at the Wind Feline Foundation, we had a lot to do with the idea that remdesivir, a drug for, a drug like it, that was used for cats, could even be used for human beings and work. And it turns out that it does work, which is amazing. I've got amazing news for you. You can win a copy of this book right here, Decoding Your Cat. Now, the Wind Feline Foundation is a not-for-profit organization, so we are here to inform and educate. That is a part of our mission, but a greater part of our mission is to raise money so we can continue to do those cat health studies. So you can text. I'm about to give you a number, and it's a long number. You'll need a pen for this, unless you're smarter than me, and you probably are. Your memory won't be able to do this. So get a pen or something to write on. Uh, because if you text the number I'm about to give you at that number, the word cats, uh, then you could win a copy of the book if you make a donation. The donation could be anywhere from just a couple bucks, but we prefer $5 million or anything in between. All right, so you ready? You ready for the number? 833-985-2287. I'll do it again, and I'll try to do it again before the end of this webinar, 833-985-2287. Text the word CATS to that number. Uh, by the way, the promo code when you make the donation is LITTER. Easy enough to remember in this case, right? So you go to the Wind Feline website and you make a donation there or 833-985-2287 is the number. Um, the webinar, this webinar is prevented, presented, <laughs> prevented, is that what I said? No, it's presented by the International Cat Association, TICA, as well as the Cat Fanciers Association and the Wind 
Feline Foundation. Now, let's get to it. Dr. Megan Heron is the Senior Director of Behavioral Medicine, Education, and Outreach at Gigi's, a shelter organization dedicated to improving the lives of shelter dogs. We can't say the word dogs today. Prior to her current <laughs> position, she spent over a decade as an associate professor in the Department of Veterinary Clinical Sciences as head of the Behavioral Medicine Service at the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine Center. She graduated from the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine and became board certified as a diplomate in the American College of Veterinary Behavior after completing her residency at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. As a published author and seasoned international speaker, she's too young to be a seasoned editor, but she does. She talks all over the world and we get her today. Dr. Heron is the lead editor of that book, this book, Decoding Your Cat. I was, right, I was honored to write the introduction, by the way, for that book. And the Win Feline Foundation is mentioned in this book. The American College of Veterinary Behaviorists, her uh, colleagues with the college, Help to author of the book, so it's written by top-notch experts in animal behavior. So it is finally my pleasure to introduce and welcome you to Dr. Heron. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to the Wind Feline Foundation for hosting me today. It's truly a privilege to speak to all of you today. Um, wish I could see your faces in person. I can't even see your faces on the computer, but I'm just going to pretend, imagine you're all there. Um, so we're going to talk about feline elimination problems, which, as Steve highlighted, is one of the leading causes, well, the leading cause of death for our feline friends. Um, all right, showing my screen. Okay, hopefully someone will tell me if this isn't showing up correctly. But all right, so I do have to warn you: we do have viewer discretion advised for some of our photos. And the, uh, the it's all there, just so you know. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we have our first poll, I believe. So I'm hoping that's working. However, many of you would use this toilet. I think I'd have to be pretty desperate. The poll is up. All right, so vote away. Anyone who would use this? Only if desperate. Either way, I won't share what your answer is. If you said yes, absolutely, I won't judge you. Sometimes we really gotta go. But anyways, I I, I put up that gross picture. Um, hopefully this is working. So I need to close something. Nope, I'll take care of it. We're gonna close the poll in just a moment. Okay, so I can keep going. All right. Keep All right, going. I, just, I highlight that because we often expect our cats to do so. Um, we keep our litter boxes in the basement in a corner. We ignore it for days to weeks um, till sometimes forever and expect them to keep using a toilet that hasn't been flushed in ages. Okay, I'm going to show I'm going to show you the results now. Okay. <laughs> Somebody said yes. <laughs> hey, it's desperate. You never know. <laughs> All right. Okay. So. Those of you who have already read or purchased uh, Decoding Your Cat know that in our feline elimination chapter, we talk about, we start the chapter by talking about Stella. So Miss Stella was a cat who was found as a kitten by her loving parents. Um, they were cats, they had always adored cats, but had never actually had a cat. They brought Miss Stella home. They gave her a loving place to live, did all, they could buy every new toy at the pet store, gave her food, water, litter box, scratching posts, even spent time out of their day, both of them penciled in time to spend with her. So she was not lonely and always felt like she was loved. The issue was just a few weeks after bringing her home, they started noticing that she was eliminating outside of the box. It started with a little pee, a little bit of poop here and there close to the litter box, but it very quickly expanded to other areas in the home, their rugs, their laundry baskets, their carpeting, and uh, their love for Stella, while strong, that bond was, was stretching with having to pick up excrement every single day. Because as we all know, it's not pretty, it's not fun, it smells terrible, and sometimes it can be really difficult to get out of our belongings and our carpets. 
Fortunately for Stella, she had a great veterinarian who asked a lot of questions at her vaccine appointments, uh, such as, hey, is Stella having any issues using the litter box? Well, how many litter boxes do you have? What kind of litter are you using? Where's the litter box? And how often are you cleaning it? And bingo, they hit the nail on the head right there. Well, as I said, these were new, these were first time cat owners and they had no idea that cats needed a flush toilet in order to continue to use a litter box. So what was happening is they had purchased a plain clay litter, kind of kept it in the corner of a basement and ignored it for the week and then just dumped it once a week, thinking they were doing a great job by once a week that felt frequent to them because they didn't know any better, dumping the entire contents of the litter and putting fresh stuff in. What they didn't realize is that Stella really needed her toilet to be flushed every day. And so they switched to a clumping style litter so that they could easily scoop out the balls of urine and her feces every single day and Stella never had a problem again. So while this could have been a disaster, thanks to their veterinarian who just asked a few simple questions, they figured out the root of the problem and Stella lived a long, happy life without any more um, elimination outside her box. All right, so before we talk about problems or abnormal elimination behaviors, we first need to talk about what's normal. And that starts with their preferences. So as you see in my background here, this is a giant sandbox because that is probably like the golden toilet version of every every cat's dream litter box right it's big it's a fine sandy material you'll notice that cats that are outdoors will seek out these fine sandy substrates like sand sandboxes or dirt is they just they, they look for that it feels comfortable on their paws it's very easy to dig and very easy to use that substrate to cover their excrement um, which as I'll show you soon, they can take up a lot of real estate and a lot of that substrate to do so. So here's a video of a cat, just to illustrate how much real estate they take up. So this cat is doing a normal pattern of digging and that spot wasn't good enough. So we're gonna dig another hole over here. And then turn doing the normal posture of squatting, putting that tail off to the side, fully avoiding that bladder or vowel, they don't do both in one setting. They will do one cover and then the other in most cases. But here, this kitty's clearly gotta go, a full void of that bladder, and then we use lots of sand to cover it up. So just to illustrate actually how much real estate cats use when given the opportunity to eliminate in their preferred texture. So you'll see there's a lot of There we go. And we feel like we've done a good job, so we're done. All right, so in a normal 24 hours, most cats are gonna urinate two to four times. So if you're using a clumping litter, you should be scooping out two to four balls of urine. And those can be, again, if they're going four times, they're probably the size of a golf ball. If they're going two times, it may be more the size of a baseball. Um, some cats do really like to hold it, maybe more softball size if they're going once a day, but I get a little concerned for cats that are only urinating once a day in the litter box because there's something, there's a reason why they're, why they're holding it. Um, they also tend to move their bowels one to two times a day. Um, cats that are moving on to every other day bowel movements, I might be getting concerned about some constipation or reluctance to use the box um, for bowel movements for one reason or another. So when we get into what's inappropriate inhalation, as Steve actually mentioned in his introduction, we call this feline inappropriate elimination, is really just defined as elimination outside of a human designated area. And we, keyword here is human. So what the human doesn't like or what the human prefers as a, as a toilet um, may not be the same as what the cat prefers. And so we're actually coming away from the term inappropriate because it may seem quite appropriate for Stella, for example, it was quite appropriate for her to pee in a clean laundry basket of clothes that are soft, absorbable, and cleaned immediately compared to this litter box that hadn't been scooped in a whole week. Didn't seem inappropriate to her. So I, we're now coming towards the term feline undesirable elimination because it's really the humans that feel like it's inappropriate, but it isn't necessarily inappropriate for the cat. So we refer to it as feline undesirable elimination. And it's the most common cat behavior problem reported to veterinarians. Um, and the top reasons why cats are relinquished to a shelter and unfortunately, um, euthanasia. So cats die from this problem, but we can prevent this. It's all about education. Remember, just like Stella, just having basic litter box management information saved her life. All right, so why would a cat choose not to use the box? 
I have found over my decade of experience in treating cats with elimination problems, it, it boils down to one of these six things. Either a sense of pain in elimination or an urgency to get to the box, which we would classify as medical causes, which I will get into in a little more detail a bit later. And then our other behavioral reasons, so stress or anxiety, an aversion or a dislike of the box, a preference for something else that's not the box, or a form of sexual or territorial communication. So we'll talk first about the behavioral reasons why cats are gonna eliminate outside the box. And the first thing to determine is whether this is a marking behavior or a toileting behavior, because their intentions are quite different. So urine marking is your classic spraying cat. You'll see a standing posture. You may see a little bit of a shake of the tip of that tail just before or as they eliminate. It is usually on vertical surfaces. And I say usually because I have seen plenty of cats that will horizontally or squat mark. Um, so you can't always count on it being vertical. It is typically a small amount, but not always. So it's not, you have to look at the whole picture to determine if it really is urine marking. I would say one of the telltale signs that a cat is urine marking as opposed to toileting is the absence of digging and covering behaviors. So that cat I just showed you in the video, all of that digging and sniffing and covering, that is what cats do when they toilet. When cats are marking, they're leaving a message, so they don't want to cover it up. So if you see your cat eliminate, or you have video coverage, a spy cam to see your cat eliminate, it eliminates and walks away without investigating or digging and covering, even going through the motions of digging and covering, even if there's nothing there to cover it, then it's likely going to be urine marking behavior. The other component of how to determine if your cat is urine marking is the location of where the marking's happening. So typically, those are going to be in socially relevant locations. And by that, I mean something that is meaningful to the cat that is either going to make them stressed out or sometimes they're overly attached to someone and they might be missing them. But there is a relevance to where they're going. Often we'll see this as items of certain household members, the favorite place of another pet, particularly if there's social tension either towards a dog or in between cats. They may want to urine mark on the areas that have the scent of that other animal. Uh, we will often see this in window or door frames in situations where there are outdoor cats that may be either taunting the indoor cats or they may be marking outside the periphery of the home and that is stressing out the indoor cats. So they may be marking where they have visual access to outdoor cats. We can also see it on new household items, um, whether that's new furniture, whether that's renovated cupboards or new kitchens. Uh, I once had um, a pair of kitties that were confined during a kitchen renovation for a couple of weeks. When the kitchen was finished, it's beautiful new backsplash, granite countertops, beautiful cupboards. Well, the cats urine marked all over, all over that backsplash and cupboard and caused quite a bit of damage because they were so stressed out about the novelty and the newness of that changed kitchen. So here's a video just to show you some of the postures we will see in a urine marking cat. So you're gonna see sniffing, they're gathering information and we don't have a great camera angle here, but the cat is opening her mouth ever so slightly, which tells me she's doing something called gaping, which is how they're detecting pheromones or messages. So then she turns around, or he or she, I actually can't tell. We didn't get a close up. Um, so females will spray or urine mark the same way that males will. And you'll see that little flick of the tail, that upright posture. And as I said, it's usually a small amount, but in this case, as you can see, it was quite a bit. And then the cat walks away. There's no investigating, there's no covering up, there's no digging, nothing. Left his message and walked away. So that's pretty classic urine marking posture here. All right, so I think we're ready for another poll. So why do we think cats mark? Poll is up. All right, are we good? And poll is closed. Okay. Now I can't see the results on my screen. You can show me after, but everyone else can well, see. Well, 82% said all of the above. Okay. <laughs> well, that would be 
the correct answer. All right, lots of reasons why cats are gonna mark. Um, but as you can see, the main reason is to leave a message. Are we good? Go ahead. I'm just seeing me though. I don't see my presentation. Your presentation's okay. up. It's up. Okay, well, I don't see it. Um, can you come down there to is. the lower court? There it is. There it is. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right, so what message? There's lots of reasons, as we said. So uh, as we'll talk about, a lot of our household cats are trying to send the message that they're anxious about something or they are stressed about something in the, or someone in their environment. Um, sorry. Um, they may be sending the message to those outdoor cats, stay off my turf, stay away from my house. They could be sending a message to another cat in the household, stay away from my stuff, stay away from me. Um, we also have sexual marking. I'm in heat, uh, or I'm looking for females, right? They leave those messages because they may not be living in the same vicinity, so they have to leave these messages through urine. Um, but they also may be trying to communicate that they are in pain. So we see a lot of cats will talk about interstitial cystitis, who it's hurt, where it's hurting to eliminate. That then causes them to have stress and to urine mark as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, it's, it's a message, as I said, in cats that are living outdoors or their wild ancestors, urine marking was used to essentially send a letter to another cat, it's like pen pals. So we leave this cat here, you know, single gray female searching for orange tabby and white male. Here's where you can find me, here's my bill. So this is how they communicated sexual signaling um, so they could find each other and find a mate. Um, we can see some level of sort of turf pairing that they might do as well, but. In a lot of cases, as I said, it's about stress, but it's still communicating, hey, to other cats, this place is stressful. I'm really anxious right now. I'm feeling upset about all these things. And it's like they're leaving a little message. So whether they're writing a letter, sending an email, whatever you want to call it, this little message here just describes their state of mind in that moment. So moving on to undesirable toileting. So we talked about urine marking as a form of communication being one reason cats are going to eliminate outside the box. And then we move to undesirable toileting, which is just avoiding of a bladder in an area that is not the litter box. So when they are toileting outside their litter box, the behavior is essentially identical. So that cat I showed you in the video, who was digging, turning around, squatting, moving that tail to the side and eliminating on a horizontal surface and then covering it all back up again, that's exactly what this looks like when it's outside of the box. The difference being in some cases, there isn't an actual substrate to do that. So let's say, for example, a cat that is squatting to toilet on a carpet, then they just sort of go through the motions of covering it up. They aren't actually pulling up the carpet or anything to cover it up, but they still go through the, mo the motions. So if you have your spy cam and you're catching your kitty in the act or you see them eliminate in front of you, and you actually have the patience to wait and see what they do, if you see them scratching around like they are trying to cover the area, that is a telltale sign your cat is toileting. It is not a sign of a marking behavior. If they're marking, they don't want to cover it up. They want to leave a message loud and clear. If they're toileting, it's in their nature to want to at least go through the motions to cover that up. And these are always going to be on horizontal services. because Again, it's that squatting same posture that they're going to show in the litter box. So as you can see in this picture here, this is a cat whose preferred location was the kitchen sink. Squatting location, squatting posture, tail off to the side, and then would just scratch on the walls and along the sink to pretend to cover it up. All right, so why not toilet it in the box? It basically boils down to typically either an aversion to something 
or a preference for something else. So they don't like the litter box, they don't like what's in the litter box, or they don't like where the litter box is located. Then they can also have preference. Well, eh, what's in the box is okay, but I really have a preference for something else, like a soft comforter or a pillow or carpeting. You can also have cats that just have a strong preference for another location. Some cats just have a specific location of, I wanna pee here, this is where I want a toilet, this is where I feel safe. This is what feels free from things that are scary for me. And unfortunately, if that's in your dining room, you know, that means you need to have a, a toilet option in your dining room. But um, often their preferences don't match our human preferences for where we want to have a toilet in our home. So what's not to like? Why would, what are things about the box that a cat might not like just naturally? So we talked about Stella already, how the box wasn't clean. So as you can see in this picture up here with the cover on it, there's quite a bit of excrement there. So it's possible, it's one of two things. Either this is a cat that doesn't like to have a cover. What covers do is they tend to trap smells so that the cat is stuck in this unflushed porta pot I guess you can say, that hasn't been changed in a while. They, and um, it traps the odors and then people don't tend to smell it as well. So it may not get cleaned as often. The other reason some cats might not like the covered box is that it blocks their view. So they don't have a good vantage point of their surroundings. So if there's a dog or another cat or any other social tension and they're concerned about being ambushed, they may not want to enter a box that has a cover. But as you can see here, I think it's a, the combination of a cover and the fact that this hasn't been cleaned very often. So lack of cleanliness is the top reason why cats might have an aversion to the box. It can also be a liner. So imagine getting, I mean, this is on top of something that doesn't look very stable. This picture here in the top middle, um, there's a trash bag as a liner, which probably makes a crunchy, sound that may be aversive to some cats. The other thing about liners that can be problematic is that if they get their claws caught in it and they get stuck, it's really uncomfortable for the cat. And that's gonna cause them not to wanna use that box again. Um, you know, for cats that don't like the litter, this picture on the upper right, the cat perching on the box, it looks like she says the box is okay, the location's okay, but I don't wanna touch that litter. So cats that are perching on the edge of their litter like this, it's often that something about that litter they just don't like. Whether it's not the fine sandy texture that they prefer or whether they've developed an aversion for some other reason like pain, which we'll talk about soon. You know, down here we have the litter to cat size ratio, right? The box is smaller than the actual cat so they don't have room. They don't have that real estate to really dig in and move around. Um, you might have dogs or cats that ambush them. So the location they don't like. Again, you can see in all these pictures, there's plenty of reasons why cats would avoid using these litter boxes. So this brings us to our next poll. So aversions as a result of pain. All right, I'm not sure if you're doing the poll, but I'll just go. So I'll give away the answer. So aversion. So it can take a just a single event of a painful experience in a litter box to create a long lasting, if not permanent aversion to a litter box. So a cat goes, they, they dig, they eliminate, and it hurts. Let's say they have bladder stones, or let's say they have interstitial cystitis, or let's say they have arthritis, and that motion to defecate was super painful, their brain makes that connection and says, ouch, that hurt, and it's this litter box's fault, or it's the litter's fault, and then they don't want to use it again. And the next time they have to eliminate, they go to that box, they investigate, and they are, that memory gets triggered, almost like a elimination PTSD, like, ooh, last time I was in here and tried to pee, it really hurt. So I'm going to go right next to the box is a very classic pattern where they have a painful experience and they go right next to a box. This is very common with cats who have constipation problems. They have a painful bowel movement. Next thing you know, they're pooping outside that box. They know they're supposed to go in that area, but they just, mm, they have a bad memory of that, so they're pooping right next to the box. Um, and I would say when the only issue you're seeing is stools outside the box, like the cat is eliminating, it's urinating, no problem, but it's just pooping outside the box. I have never had a case that there wasn't a medical reason to explain that. 
whether it was constipation, diarrhea, anal gland disease, arthritis, there's a reason cats are pooping outside the box. If they're only pooping and not peeing, then I have a strong inclination to think it hurt when they pooped. There's a medical reason why they started pooping outside of the box. And even though we may resolve that inciting, inciting reason for pain, sometimes these patterns can persist, particularly if they go on for a long period of time. They, it, that initial sort of PTSD, it hurts when I go there, I'm gonna go here. The longer they practice that behavior, the harder it's gonna be to resolve because they develop a new habit. So some common preferences we might see for cats tend to be your soft absorbable substrates. So whether that's your bedding, your pillows, um, an area of rugs. It's very common for people who have litter boxes in bathrooms or laundry rooms and they have an area of rug right next to it. They look at the box for some reason they don't like it and they go on the closest soft absorbable material and often that's the mat or a, a, a bin of laundry or a clean towel. We can see carpeting be a preferred substrate as well and I think the classic is this laundry basket. Again, it's the size and shape of a litter box. It's got nice absorbable material and typically my people clean it very quickly after I eliminate in it. So it becomes a self-reinforcing preference. We can have cats with less common preferences, which is more a hard surface. So this isn't absorbable. So again, this doesn't link with their natural preferences, but I have seen cats that just from kittenhood for whatever reason, they had a preference for sinks, bathtubs, countertops, or these sort of solid surfaces. And we have to get, I don't get too far into this, into this talk, but these are cats where we have to get pretty creative for their litter box options because their preferences are outside what is typical for a cat. So location matters. So we talked about the style of the litter box and why it might be aversive to them. Talked about the litter. Again, the litter, we want that fine sandy substrate, typically something clumping that we can keep it nice and, nice and clean. But even if you've got the best litter box and the best litter, if it's in a bad location or an undesirable location for this cat, it's not going to matter. They aren't going to go there. So you want to make sure your litter box is in an area that's easily accessible, that they don't have to go down, up or down three flights of stairs, jump over two baby gates, go around the corner and, and go through a cat door to get into some secret area that no one can see. If it's too difficult for them to access it, particularly if that cat is over 10, and developing some early signs of osteoarthritis, they're gonna skip that trip to the litter box pretty quickly and start going in an area that they prefer. So typically we want a quiet area. They don't wanna be startled um, or bothered while they are mid elimination. because That can really cause them to not wanna go to that location ever again. Um, you want it to be free from agonistic encounters. By agonistic, we mean anything associated with tension or fighting. So you see this kitty in this picture here is just sitting ever so peacefully and quietly. But I have had situations where there's two cats in a household and one cat will place itself strategically in an area just like this cat and stare down the other cats trying to access the litter box. So if their only path to get to the litter box is to go around in front of this cat who is staring them down and then attacking them, they're not going to want to go in that location regardless of how wonderful the litter box is. The other thing we want to think about is that we want to have our litter boxes an adequate distance from food and water. Cats do not want to pee or poop where they eat. Most people don't either, right? You wouldn't want to set up your um, TV stand and table right next to your toilet unless you had some medical reason to do so. Um, so we want to give them some space. That said, we don't want this litter box so far away from their living area that it's it's too foreign for them to go to. So we want it to be near what we call a core area. And by that, I mean an area where the cat spends time, where they might interact with family, where they have comfortable resting places and perches. It is near to that, not necessarily smack dab in the center. And again, we want it far away from food and water, but near that area. So it isn't too much trouble for them to venture off to that location. So I show these two pictures there. I want you to just take a second to look at both pictures and look at from both the cat's point of view and the human point of view about what is appealing or maybe what's less appealing to both the people and the cat and comparing the two. So if you look at the picture on the left, you see hardwood floors that are clean. We see a little bit of a shade there to sort of hide the box um, so that the cat feels like they have a little bit of privacy, but it's not completely covered. So the cat could still have a bit of a vantage point. 
Um, judging by the fact that it's near a window and a couch tells me it's an area where the family spends time. So it's near a core area. It also looks like it's it's open and we've got a little bit of litter there. Um, with It's hard to tell in the picture, but my hope, I'm gonna assume that that's a plumbing clay. Um, so anyways, easily accessible. It's also open so that if there's excrement in it and there's an odor, the people who are likely spending time in this room as well can smell it and are gonna scoop it and change it immediately. So when we look at the other room, it's beautiful. This is a beautiful design, right? So from the human perspective, it's conveniently located in the laundry room, so away from an area where they may have guests or be eating dinner. Um, it's conveniently located here. It's not in the way, nobody's tripping over it and it's hiding the smells. But when you look at this from the cat's point of view, there's a few things that might be problematic. So first of all, we see a little cat flap to access it. So we have an, access, an accessibility issue. So a cat that has to squeeze through a hole if they're a larger cat, or if it's difficult for them to make that climb might be problematic. It's also essentially an enclosed box. So if that box has not been scooped that day, it's gonna be trapping smells. So as they stick their head through that little flap, it may be really aversive to them if there's some strong smells of ammonia or feces. We're also right next to a couple things in the environment that can tend to get loud. So let's say you have an unbalanced load in this washing machine. It's gonna be slamming up against the wall with this litter box. Is. Imagine a poor cat is midstream of urination and suddenly there's a banging on the wall and they're trapped inside there. That cat is not gonna to wanna to enter there again. And then lastly, you see, I think, I assume this is a lovely little pet washing area. But imagine if they're washing the dog above and the cat is down here using the box, the sound of the water or the sound of the animal up top really could create an environment that is less appealing for that cat. So just kind of want to show you some examples. And we want things to be appealing to people so that they'll actually want to have a cat and want to keep them around. But there are ways to have a litter box and it can still look pretty and it can still be hidden. You can still have guests um, without you know, causing your cat to have to go somewhere else to eliminate. So just food for thought. Think of it from both the cat's and the human point of view, right? Because we, we matter. Uh, we as people and cat families matter. The hope is that you can find some compromise that works for both. All right, so we do have a concept known as anxiety-related toileting. So as I said before, stress and anxiety are a big cause of why cats might urine and mark. But we can also see stress or anxiety um, really lower the threshold for litter box um, hygiene. So we can see cats just toilet on a bed or toilet in another location because of social and environmental stressors. So if they're stressed about the dog or the kids or other cats, they may just choose an area that feels safe to them and that's their preferred toilet. We can also see cats with separation anxiety, wanting to toilet in areas where they feel safe or they're seeking out the scent of their owner. You can see urine marking as a result of separation anxiety as well, but I've also seen cats with separation anxiety who will start to toilet, so urinate and defecate with those covering behaviors outside of the box. And what we find is that stress can really lower the threshold for a tolerance of suboptimal litter box management. So let's say you've gotten away with scooping your box only twice a week, maybe you have a cover on it, maybe it's in a location that isn't great because there's a heater that goes on and it's really loud. Your cat tolerated that for the first three years, but then you had a baby and added a bunch of stress to your cat's life, now that no longer works for them, so they're gonna start toileting elsewhere. So we refer to that as anxiety-related toileting. And as I said earlier, you can also have anxiety-related marking. So stress as a culprit, again, whether it's toileting or marking, it affects cat's elimination patterns because sometimes peeing on things just makes you feel better. Uh, this can be a result of social group changes. Maybe there's a new pet, maybe a new baby, a new partner. Um, you can also have the departure of a family member. Someone passes away, maybe a child goes off to college and that was their preferred person. Those changes can affect our cats dramatically and really affect their elimination patterns as well. As we talked about environmental changes like kitchen renovations can cause cats to stress mark or stress toilet. Um, change in schedule or an extended absence of a family member, people going on vacation um, for weeks at a time can often trigger undesirable elimination patterns. We talked about before how cats outside the home can be stressing out the indoor cats and causing them to eliminate, um, as well as tension between cats living in the same home. That is a big cause for tension. Um, and you'd be surprised at what cats perceive as stress. So something like this cute little puppy, why would that be stressful to a cat? She's not really acting stressed, she's still eating. But this puppy's chewing on her ear, 
probably chasing her around. This puppy's probably looking for companionship. But to that cat, it, it may not be received. And it could be enough to tip this cat over the edge to start toileting elsewhere or to start stress marking. So again, what we might perceive as stress can be very different to what a cat perceives. And often they are much more sensitive than we might think. So this brings us to the concept of feline interstitial cystitis, or what we abbreviate as FIC. So this is defined as stress-induced inflammation of the bladder wall. So as we know in cats, in dogs, in people, stress is gonna activate a physical change, a physical response from the body. This then causes the release of substances that regulate inflammation and pain. And this can, in some cats, lead to bladder pain and bleeding. So there are susceptible cats. Now there are some cats that can be stressed to the max and they're never ever gonna pee blood in their life. But there are susceptible cats, just like there are susceptible humans. There is an interstitial cystitis related to stress in people as well. But in cats, there are certain cats that for whatever reason they are predisposed to when they have any sort of stressor, that manifests through a change in the bladder wall where they start to bleed and have pain. And even the most benign of stressors can trigger a flare-up event of FIC. And those of you who have an FIC cat are probably very familiar with that. And how you have to plan very carefully if you're going to change your schedule or you're going to go out of town. You have to be super careful so your cat doesn't start being blood. All right, so now I'm going to just go through a handful of myths. So in decoding your cat, in each of our chapters, we kind of walk through an is that really true? section where we just debunk a few of, of common misconceptions or myths for cats. I'll just highlight a few here. So a common one we hear is my cat is being spiteful when he eliminates outside the litter box. You know, this concept that cats are vengeful or spiteful and they're getting back at us by doing this. So what I try to say to people when they, they tell me this is trying not to take it personally. Typically, your cat is trying to tell you something when they're going outside the box, but it is more often a cry for help than a vengeful message. As I said, Stress and anxiety are a big cause for elimination. So spite and ven being vengeful really have nothing to do with it. Another common one we'll hear is my cat is marking to show dominance. Isn't really true. So by definition, dominance is related to access to resources over another social group member. So cats that know each other well, who are in the same social group, have a series of interactions so they figure out who gets access to the, the valued resources like food, water bowl, the best resting spots, proximity to their people, and they figure it out. And the higher ranking cat is gonna have preferential access. The other cats are kind of gonna give them a wide berth and let them have first dibs. And then there's no tension. That's what dominance is about. Depositing urine is unrelated to that. It has nothing to do, you don't gain access to the food bowl by peeing next to it or by peeing on another cat because you want access to it. Now, if you're stressed about not having access to that, you might stress mark, but it's not about trying to show I'm dominant by peeing on something. Um, it's more about stress um, or some sort of messaging, whether it's territory um, or sexual. For cats that are intact, it's very normal for them to urine mark to leave sexual messages, but again, have nothing to do with dominance. I need to reprimand my cat when he pees outside of the litter box. I have a lot of people say this. Well, if I catch them in the act, I have to let them know it's wrong. I have to let them know it's bad. Um, and the first thing I say to that is, A, cats are not moral creatures. They don't really understand that this is bad or wrong. They're just, again, trying to communicate something or they're simply seeing what they feel is an appropriate place to toilet. And so as we've already talked about, stress is a huge reason why cats are eliminating outside their box. Punishment triggers a stress response. And so you are probably shooting yourself in the foot or making your problem worse. Um, by punishing these behaviors that are often stress-related. So it may exacerbate the issue, um, or what it may do is teach them that, wow, it's not okay to pee in front of you, so I'm gonna be sneaky about this. And so they're gonna start choosing an alternate location or be more discreet about it so that you don't see them doing it, right? It doesn't necessarily teach them that, oh, my mom got upset when I peed on her pillow, so I shouldn't ever pee on pillows again. It's just, I shouldn't pee on the pillow in front of her, or I shouldn't pee on this pillow, right? You really have gotta to get to the root of the problem not just try to punish what you see in front of you. All right, and so when we talk about what if, what if we do see cats eliminating, we don't just wanna say, all right, here's the red carpet to my bed, go ahead and pee, do what you want. We wanna do our best to try to deter them rather than punishing them from using those preferred areas. And so we can do that both by decreasing the attractiveness of those preferred areas, 
as well as decreasing their access to those areas. And so when we are cleaning an area, if we find an area of carpet that has been um, urinated upon, what we wanna do is grab an appropriate cleaner. And so by appropriate, I mean enzymatic. So I've got a few in the background. So I love Urine Away. It's one of my favorite products. But there's also Nature's Miracle, which is readily available at most pet supply stores, and then Anti-Icky Poo. Well, the name speaks for itself. So what these do is they have enzymes and bacteria that are gonna break down the organic material in the urine and in the feces, if that's what you're cleaning, so that the cats don't smell it again. Cats are gonna be attracted to eliminate where they can smell urine or feces. And so if we don't fully saturate these areas, they may be drawn to eliminate there again. And so typically what you need to do is soak the carpet, let it soak all the way into the pad. And then over the next two to three days, the drying action is how we get those um, organic materials broken down. Now, in this case, if the urine is already dry, it may mean that that smell is reinvigorated as you put this cleaner on initially, but give it a couple days and it's worth that extra effort and worth the time of letting it dry so that they are deterred from going there again. In some cases, we will place what we call deterrents. So things that are unappealing, uh, but not painful to the cat. So foil, it's not really fun for a cat to walk on foil and hopefully not even less fun for them to actually eliminate on top of foils. We just roll out the aluminum foil and pop it on the spots where they've been going on the carpet. Some cases we'll use upside down carpet runner. So that is that plastic mat that you'll find on a roll. You cut it to kind of keep carpet in place. Well, if you put it upside down, it has these little spikes on it that are not painful. They're dull enough that they're just uncomfortable and annoying. So cats aren't gonna wanna spend time on it and typically aren't gonna wanna eliminate on top of it. Bubble wrap is another option. It just doesn't feel fun. And if they pop it, um, they aren't gonna wanna walk there. So it just deters them from going in that area. Um, Again, we can decrease access, so you can block areas that they can't get to. If it's a certain room that they like to eliminate in, we can just block their air access there. And in some cases, if we don't have the ability to block access to their preferred areas, um, or if they have lots of preferred areas in your home, some you can find them to a safe haven when we're not able to supervise them. So that said, if we are decreasing attractiveness, decreasing their access, none of that's gonna work if we don't increase the attractiveness of the litter box. So you have to do both. It's not just about don't pee here, but it's also about, and you really wanna pee here, right? You've gotta do both or it's not gonna work. All right, so our last little myth here is I need to lock my cat in the bathroom to teach her to use the litter box, right? And you know, typically new kittens don't need to be taught to use the litter box. They have that natural preference to seek out that fine, Sandy texture, so they typically is the litter box, and if it's easily accessible and big and deep and cleaned often enough, then cats are just naturally drawn to it. So we don't typically need to, to lock a cat in the bathroom to teach them this. Um, and in fact, confinement may cause stress and worsen the problem. Confinement in itself, while sometimes used as a tool for our big picture um, in how we're treating an elimination disorder, it's not going to resolve the issue if that's the only thing you're doing. If the other dynamics are not changed, if we're not making them a wonderful, beautiful toilet that they are really attracted to using, um, we're not dealing with the household stress that may be triggering them to eliminate or say the pain that may be causing them to have an aversion, it's not gonna resolve the issue. So if we do need to utilize confinement, let's say we do have a cat that has a lot of preferred areas outside the home and it's really outside of the litter box area and it's really difficult to place deterrence in all of those areas or to block their access, then we're gonna rely a little bit on confinement. And again, this isn't for every cat. There are some cats that have confinement anxiety and this just isn't gonna work for them. But for your average cat, if we set it up right and essentially create what we call a safe haven, we can actually really create a refuge for them where they really feel at peace, there's no social tension here, and it's a refuge from any other stressors they may experience in the rest of the house. So in this safe haven, we wanna make sure they have access to food, to water, fresh water, ideally moving water, so a fountain, um, rest, perch, and hiding options. So cats who really wanna be up high, they wanna be looking out the window, they wanna be able to, for cats who really like to feel concealed, they may wanna hide inside of something. Scratching options, whether that's vertical or horizontal, it all depends on your cat's preferences. Toys, so those are both toys that they can play with on their own, so food dispensing puzzle toys are great for these rooms but also toys that you actually play with with them that are interactive. Clearly you wanna have access to litter boxes 
Um, if your cat is having an elimination problem, the box is part of that is important, so meaning more than one box, so they have options. Um, and then social time. So that is you as a human being are going in there and spending time with your cat in this room. I do have some families that will make the cat safe haven in their bedroom because that's where they spend a lot of time. The cat feels very safe there and they have a bedroom and maybe an ensuite bathroom that's big enough to provide all of these things and the cat feels very safe um, when confined there. Okay, so we've talked about some of the main reasons why cats might wanna eliminate outside the box um, and some of the ways to sort of manage keeping them away from their preferred areas, but let's talk about our full approach to treating these issues. So we have to start by addressing the medical issues. As I said in my earlier slide, pain and urgency are some of the top two reasons why cats are gonna start going to the bathroom outside of their litter box. We also need to optimize the litter box dynamics. So it is the most wonderful, most appealing toilet possible. And then we also have to look at enriching the environment. Because as we said, stress is the top reason why cats are going to eliminate outside the box. If we enrich their environment, we can combat some of those stressors. And then if needed, anti-anxiety meds can be used as an adjunct on top of that. But we never just reach for our meds without doing those top three of addressing our medical issues, optimizing the litter box, and enriching the heck out of the environment. All right, so let's talk about medical conditions that we might need to address. So urinary tract discomfort. So urinary tract infections are actually not very common in cats at all, but they can happen. And it could be a, a reason for cats to experience pain when urinating. Bladder stones are something cats can have. Um, some cats are predisposed to these issues and other it's, it's related to the, their diet and the pH in their urine that may need to be adjusted. We've talked about feline interstitial cystitis or FIC, so that bladder wall is inflamed. And we can also see transitional cell carcinoma, not super common, but it is a type of bladder cancer that can cause cats to be very painful and to urinate blood. We can see, as I talked about, urgency. So I've got to get to the litter box more often because my body's actually making more pee. So cats with chronic kidney disease, cats with diabetes, hyperthyroidism, and kidney infections. So something we call pyelonephritis. So that's a, uh, an infection that's actually asymptomatic to the kidneys. Super, super painful. Um, can be life-threatening, it can actually shut down their kidney function. But these, these are all gonna cause a cat to drink more and pee more and have that increase in urgency. It's also gonna mean their litter box is dirtier because they're peeing more, they're soiling it more frequently. For GI discomfort, so history of diarrhea, one bout of constipation created a painful bowel movement. Anal gland disease, so whether it's an impacted anal gland, an infected anal gland, or if just something is wrong, it's causing pain when they poop, um, because they have two anal glands that are right next to their rectum. And so those are expressed every time they have a bowel movement. We can also see spinal or pelvic pain. So osteoarthritis of any part of that rear end is gonna cause them to have difficulty when eliminated. And so typically to rule out these medical conditions, your veterinarian is gonna need to do a full physical examination. Often we wanna do, I, I recommend if your cat is peeing outside the box, you wanna get blood testing, you wanna get urine testing, um, and fecal, is a, so a stool sample evaluation if your cat is pooping outside the box. Plus or minus imaging. So let's say your veterinarian gets information from the exam or lab or feels like your cat's a little constipated here. I may need to take a picture or an x-ray of your cat's belly to see the whole picture here. So in some cases, it does take quite a, a lengthy investigation to find out why your cat is going outside the box. But I can't stress to you enough how super important it is to make sure we don't have a medical reason um, for your cat to be doing this and to make sure we do our best to resolve it uh, and that make sure it doesn't occur again. Um, and so really the addressing of our medical issues is focused on making sure we have comfortable and effortless elimination. And this can be done, again, aside from medical treatments, but through diet and nutritional supplements. So we have diets that are specifically geared towards cats with arthritis, like our joint care JD, um, for cats that have a history of bladder stones or bladder pain, um, you know, you have your rural cane and urinary SO. Oh, there are so many wonderful prescription diets out there that your veterinarians can use. There are also other ways to look at pain control um, and making sure we have adequate water intake. So adequate uh, water intake is super important for bladder comfort. It's super important for stool comfort, right? Because often a, a top reason for constipation is that they aren't getting enough water. And that can be a vicious cycle of, not drinking, having pain, then not wanting to drink. We wanna just make sure 
everything is as comfortable as possible, even if there isn't a major medical issue. So then that brings us to optimizing the litter box dynamics. So we wanna start, as we talked about with Stella, we wanna clean the box daily, meaning scooping the box daily. Um, most cats are gonna want an uncovered box. Again, we talked about how the covers will trap odors. So the cats enter it, they don't like it. It feels like a tent over their toilet. They don't wanna enter. It also prevents them from having a good vantage point from other cats around them. That said, there are some cats who do prefer a cover. So those of you who are sitting there thinking, wow, all my litter boxes are covered. My cat's gonna hate it, I should remove it. If your cat's not having an elimination problem, don't go changing everything up, right? If you wanna do a preference test, you can set an uncovered box right next to a covered box and see which one they like better. There are some cats who actually like the privacy of a covered box. Um, but I would say, for the most part, your average cat, particularly one that's having a problem, is gonna want an uncovered box. Um, we talk about that fine, sandy texture. Our clumping litters, particularly clumping clay, tends to meet that preference better than the other ones out there. The other nice thing about that is when they urinate, it clumps into a nice ball that is very easy to scoop. So it makes it easy to scoop out daily, and then we change the whole thing out, um, typically weekly. You want it to be large, and by that we mean the length, the size, of the box, the length of the box should be as long, if not longer, than the length of the cat from the tip of their nose to the tip of their tail. And so you're thinking, you go to the grocery store, the pet supply store, most of those litter boxes don't meet that requirement. So as you can see here in this picture, this is a storage box where you've just cut an access hole to. So you can think out of the box when it comes to litter boxes. It doesn't have to be a quote unquote litter box. It can be a storage container or something much larger. They like the clear side so they can see all around them and that we've cut a hole for easy access to the front. And again, you want it close to a core area, so not too far away from where the cat actually spends time during the day. And you wanna think about multiple options. This is especially important for multi-cat households. So let's say you have five cats, six litter boxes, right? That seems great, but if they're all in the same location, that doesn't help you so much. So typically what we say is we want cats to have the ability to eliminate during the day, and let's say somebody else has to eliminate before their family has time to scoop that box, there's always one clean box available for them, for those really fastidious cats. So that's where our N plus one rule comes from. But if you have five cats and six litter boxes and they're all in the same room, it just takes one cat to sort of self-entertain and sit right there in the doorway of that room and prevent the other cats from accessing. So you, with really with all resources in multiple multi-cat households, you wanna have options for them so that if there's a cat occupying one location, they have the option to go to another location. Um, and as we talked about liners or collars, so collars are the little cuffs that come around that actually makes the litter box much smaller. Um, even though it may keep your household cleaner, it, it shortens the length of the litter box. So unless your litter box is really, really huge, the collars typically aren't recommended. All right, so moving on to enrichment. So enrichment allows for an animal to engage in normal, natural behaviors for which they are highly driven to perform. And he is highly driven. They are motivated to do this. It's in their nature to want to engage with their environment in certain ways. Just like a zoo animal, we have to give them enrichment. We have to give them opportunity to do their normal, natural behaviors, or we're gonna see major problems develop. They're gonna start showing what we call stereotypies, pacing, chewing, all sorts of behaviors, self-plucking of their hair, because they, they are so motivated, so driven to perform these natural behaviors. So when we can supply them with an environment that's super enriched and gives them these options, it's gonna ease their social tension and reduce stress. Whether it's a multi-cat household or a single cat household, enrichment is super important. So um, as Steve said, we could go on and on and on about so many subjects here, and I, I don't have time to go into a full enrichment talk, that's a whole nother couple of hours, but just think, I like to chalk enrichment up to four main things. So hunting, chewing, scratching, and viewing. So hunting, cats are natural predators. They're obligate carnivores. They have an innate instinct to want to chase and capture prey. Now, not every cat is going to follow through in that sequence. It's not really necessarily about eating the mouse that they're chasing, but it's that seeking behavior. It's that ability to see something moving quickly, to, to, to crouch down and stare and stalk, pounce, grab, shake, and in some cases, torture for a little while before actually consuming. But the consumption part is, is really not the important part of the hunting enrichment. So hunting options 
um, chewing options. So cat grasses, you wanna make sure that the plants in your home are safe for cats to chew because if they ingest it, it could be dangerous, right? As most of you probably know, Easter lilies are fatal to cats. So we wanna be very careful about what plants we have, but also think about what chewing options they have. There's a lot of cats that really like to chew on paper. So if you provide them paper options, they're more likely to chew that than chew up your important paperwork. Um, viewing options, right? So this is a beautiful walnut, solid walnut. Um, this is called the cat, the lotus cat. This is one of my clients. It's beautiful. Cat trees don't have to be this expensive or this beautiful, but this looks really nice. And it gives them that nice vantage point. So they can be in the periphery of the room and up high next to a window, ideally. So they're getting that nice viewing of what's going on outside, chipmunks, squirrels, birds, you name it. And also that exposure to natural sunlight, you know, and then just toys again. Um, whether it's something homemade, something you spend a lot of money on. This up here in the upper right-hand corner is called a kickaroo. The cats, it's instinctual. They see it, they grab it, they bite it, and they kick it with their back feet. Um, it's a really fun toy. But you've just got to find, when it comes to toys, find where your cat's preference is. So get a variety of different types that they don't have to be super expensive. See where your cat loves and then get a whole bunch of them. And try to change them up a bit so they don't get bored with it as well. So again, could go on and on about enrichment, but think of hunting, chewing, scratching, and viewing. Hopefully get it down. All right, so an, an additive we will put for enrichment is pheromone enrichment. So there are two main products available now. So Feloy Classic is a synthetic version of the feline facial pheromone. So when cats are bunting or cheek rubbing on you and on their environment, they are marking you and the environment as safe. Like, hey, I was here. I feel content. I feel happy. This is a good place to be. And it is also a place that's going to deter urine marking. Cats are very rarely going to facially mark something and then urine mark it later. So this product imitates this facial pheromone. So if we spray or put a diffuser of Philo A Classic in an area where a cat is marking, they shouldn't want a urine mark there. But it also, as a signal of safety, should encourage toileting. So if you have a cat with toileting issues, you may want to put the feel away near the litter boxes and put the feel away where they're marking. So in essence, the feel away classic says it communicates to the cat. It's okay to pee here, but you don't want to mark. And by pee, I mean toilet. It's okay to toilet here, but you don't want to mark here. So you want to use this differently based on which problem you think you're having. So if you have a cat that is marking your couch, you want to use feel away on the couch so they don't mark there. If you have a cat that's toileting on your couch, you don't want to put feel away there. You want to put feel away where the litter boxes are. And then the second product, which is a little bit newer, is called feel away multi cat. So this is the lactation pheromone. So a mother cat's going to release this from her mammary chain after she gives birth. And the kittens are then drawn to her because they are heat seeking and comfort seeking. It's a signal of safety, social bonding, and promotes relaxation. So this product is marketed as to decrease inner tension as well as separation anxiety. So this pheromone product is essentially communicating mommy's here. You should feel safe and we should all get along. So again, just a couple of products on the market because if the elimination problem is related to inner cat tension, then feel away multi-cat might actually be a good adjunct to your enrichment plan. And then finally, anti-anxiety medication. So as I mentioned, sometimes this is a good adjunct to everything else in our plan, right? Addressing medical issues, optimizing our litter box and enriching the environment. We have to do those three things. And then we add anti-anxiety medication when it's necessary. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a last resort. So if you're a veterinarian, after talking to you, feels like, wow, you've got a lot going on. Your cat seems really sensitive to stress and change. You've got a busy lifestyle. You've got children that are still going to be in the home, hopefully. We're, you know, we, we can't fully separate them from this cat. They might benefit from anti-anxiety medication right away in combination with our other modalities of treatment. This is a decision made between each family and their veterinarian to decide if your cat is a candidate. And if that's something you want to start at the beginning of treatment or something you want to wait, if the other options aren't working or they're not working well enough, we may add anti-anxiety medication um, as an adjunct. But again, as I stated earlier, just throwing medications at this problem is not going to resolve the issue. May improve it ever so slightly, but without optimizing our litter box, addressing our medical issues and providing enrichment, it's not going to get us very far. So in closing, cats don't bark out of spite. Stress and medical problems are the main reasons why cats are gonna eliminate outside of their box. Please consult your veterinarian early. The second, the moment your cat starts going outside of the box, talk to your vet early because we wanna stop this from becoming a habit. The longer it goes on, the harder it is to change. You wanna think about optimizing your litter box dynamics. Even if your cat's not having a problem, let's prevent them from having a problem 
but giving them the best toilet option ever. Think about environment, environmental enrichment, regardless of how well your cat is using the litter box. It's just great for their nature. It's good for their well-being. It's great for your relationship. And just remember that there are medications to help alongside environmental modification. That's a conversation you can have with your veterinarian. All right, I thank you so much for your time. As I said, we have Decoding Your Cat is available now. Um, the Win Feline Foundation is graciously offering a raffle. So thank you so much to the Win Feline Foundation for all the work that you do and for hosting me. If you want to donate to them to support the great work, the great research they support, you can text CATS to 833-985-2287. You'll be directed to a site where you can make a donation. and Just make sure you put the word LITTER in the promo code area so that you can enter to win your own copy of Decoding Your Cat, which will be mailed right to your door. So thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to win. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Heron. A round of applause, please, for Dr. I hear everyone applauding. So thank <laughs> I'm gonna I pretend to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so very much for doing this. I know that you and I have worked together and whenever I say can you jump on and talk about cat behavior. You're right there. So thank you. Thank you for that. And I know because of this talk, no cat ever again will think outside the box. <laughs> I do want to thank uh, Tika, the International Cat Association, the Cat Fanciers Association for their support. I have time, you know, we're a little over time, but can you handle a handful or a pawful of questions? I'm here. Okay. Uh, this is from Carol, our cat. Uh, her litter box is in the garage. Uh, one evening, the cat wasn't able to use the box. Now she refuses to use it. Uh, she's become an outside cat at night. That's fine, except winter will eventually be here. Carol probably doesn't live in Florida or Louisiana. So do you have any recommendation? So if I'm hearing this correctly, the cat was outside and couldn't get to the box in the garage and is now eliminating outdoors? The cat couldn't, for whatever reason, get to the, uh, maybe the garage door was closed, I don't know. Couldn't get to the garage to use the litter box. And now is saying, I'm not gonna go in there. I'll go outside because you're giving me that opportunity. Uh, but Carol yeah. says in January, maybe that opportunity is not right. a good idea. So again, it's it's sort of the, which is better? Um, so that great outdoors does provide ample opportunity. It's unfortunately sometimes your neighbor's garden. <laughs> But it, uh, there's lots of access to dirt, to sand, to that huge amount of real estate. So there's a reason why outdoor options are very attractive. And so you're going to have your work cut out for you to try to compete with that. My guess is in the winter, if things are frozen, covered in snow, that's not going to be as appealing. So you might want to think about, well, how can I make these options even better? So think about storage boxes. Think big. Making sure your cat always has access to that. Um, and that might require we have to spend more time indoors because in the winter and try to retrain them. And that's going to be because your cats learned how exciting the outdoor world is because the outdoor world is super exciting for cats. So we have to make our home compete with that. So I would dig deep into enrichment. So start doing your homework on how do I enrich the heck out of my house so that my cat wants to stay home so that when your cat's naturally drawn to being home or in the winter, summertime comes along and they're like, eh, I don't need to go outside because I've really got a great here and making sure those litter box options. You might even think about a box that's actually in the house instead of the garage. Just try to, again, come up with that compromise, right? It has to work for you as much as it works for your cat. Where's the location you can stand to have it? You put up some of those pretty shades so you don't have to stare at it, but you're scooping it and cleaning it every day, using that clumping clay litter, scooping it every day and making sure your cat really likes its options. And I think if you can motivate your cat to like what's on the inside better, it's not gonna wanna go on the outside later. Okay, uh, and by the way, Dr. Ballantyne and Dr. Pike together did a chapter on enrichment that is great uh, in Decoding Your Cat. Also, we have a celebrity who's been watching us and a supporter of the college. Uh, whenever the college does something, I see him. Uh, Dr. Jerry Flanagan is here. So, isn't that nice? So, hey, Jerry. yeah, yeah. Um, I wanna talk, we have several questions coming in about cats covering. So sometimes if people panic, if, if the cat doesn't cover its elimination, number one or number two or both, uh, Gerald points out that old cats may not cover, which is something to be expected, I think. But if it's a new change of behavior, might that tell you something else physically that the cat is hurting 
uh, and the cat isn't otherwise showing you because pain can be so uh, subtle in cats. And Leah says, my cat isn't covering. Every now and again goes in random places outside the box. But I ask you, does one thing have to do with the other? So it certainly can, and that's a good point. So again, what we talk about is what's typical. Like I said, most cats are gonna to wanna to prefer a fine sandy strub straight. They're gonna to wanna to have a lot of real estate and they're gonna to wanna to cover. There are some cats that are born that aren't coverers or, or um, if they're getting older, they don't wanna go through the effort. So an older cat who maybe has a little bit of arthritis, the effort of covering may be a little bit uncomfortable for them, so they skip it. That's okay, that's not to worry. But I would, I would be, as you mentioned, if it's a sudden change, my cat was historically a great cover and suddenly isn't, Okay, well, does it hurt to cover it? Or is there a reason you're no longer wanting to interact with the litter? As we said, if we've had a painful bowel movement or a painful urination and the cat's mind said, oh, it's the litter's fault. I, I, if I use this litter or touch this litter, bad things will happen. And so that I want to be I want to be thinking exactly that. What's hurting you? Why, why don't you want to use this anymore? Um, because it isn't a cat's instinct to want to cover because cats, again, if you look at feral cat colonies, they're eliminating within their core area. They don't want to share parasites with themselves or with each other, so it is in their nature to want to cover it. Granted, there are always cats that fall outside of the bell curve, um, but if you are seeing a sudden change, um, I would be concerned. And even if it's an older cat, I want to know, well, did you stop doing this because you're hurting? Am I adequately addressing your pain and your physical discomfort? So we can do that. Again, there are diets and supplements. Just because a cat's old doesn't mean they have to have arthritis and be painful from it. There are ways we can increase that comfort and it may encourage them to want to do that natural behavior of covering again. Okay, uh, by the way, I've just been notified that the drawing uh, is going to continue for the rest of today, I think. All I right. think that's right. So uh, the text number is right up there on your screen. Uh, so support the Win Feline Foundation. You can give anything from just a couple bucks to a couple of million dollars, which I hope you do. Uh, <laughs> and all you have to do is text that phone number, uh, text cats at that number. And then yes, as you point out, you'll be directed to a site. The promo code is litter and you're automatically then entered into the drawing to win. Uh, also, I do want to mention, I, I'm told to mention something else here. Uh, that this recording will be available for the next day to three days. Uh, so if you missed part of Dr. Heron's talk, don't panic. Don't <laughs> cause panic in the streets. You will have a couple days uh, to watch it. Um, a couple of questions about cats going up on high places. So whether it be the bed, a countertop, if a cat consistently goes up somewhere high, to urinate or to defecate, what does that tell you? So cats tend to feel safest on the periphery of a room and on an elevated surface. And so it's normal for cats to prefer high places and to be up high, at least for resting and for viewing, again, that viewing part of enrichment. If your cat is spending most of its time up high and on a periphery and also eliminating in those locations, I'd be concerned that that's the place they're feeling the safest and that tells me they're not feeling safe where their litter boxes are. So either the litter box itself, they've been ambushed there, or the path to get to their litter box is filled with danger. And so they've created a location aversion and are preferring a safer location, which up high and on the periphery of a room tends to be a safer location for them. If it's on your countertops and things that we look at every day, we're gonna clean them immediately as well. So there may be some benefit to that. Um, again, you have to look at the pattern. Do you think your cat is marking up there? Do you think your cat is toileting up there? Because it could also be if it's a multi-cat household and you're finding urine, it could be that there's some there's some tension there and that they're marking an area where maybe another cat likes to perch. So lots of things to think about. Uh, but just hanging out on the periphery and up high, totally normal, not a big deal. And we definitely want to make sure our cats have access to doing that in multiple rooms of the house. But eliminating there, I would be concerned. They're, they're either, their path is blocked or something about the location of that box is not desirable to them. Okay, so uh, one more question. Uh, that's all we have time for. I'm sorry so about sorry. that. Yeah, uh, soft things. Cats mm -hmm. do seem to like to urinate on those soft things. Mm -hmm. why, is, why? You are now a cat, Dr. Heron. Why do you <laughs> think that is? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, cats have that preference for fine, sandy texture, not only because it feels good on their paws, but because it's absorbent. So it tends to absorb, it doesn't splash. 
cats are fastidious, right? They like to be clean. They groom themselves fastidiously. And so where they eliminate, they want it to be in a nice area that's absorbent and it's not going to splash on them. And they want it to feel comfortable on their paws. So if for some reason their litter isn't providing them or they've had a painful experience with their litter, they're going to seek something else out that's comfortable. And so bedding, pillows, carpets, they're soft on their paws and they're very absorbable so they're not going to splash. And if it's things like an area rug or a laundry basket, well, those are often changed and cleaned very quickly by our people. So it's even more reinforcing because, oh, wow, my litter box gets scooped so quickly when I pee on the bed or pee on your laundry. So lots of motivations for that. But I will say that is the most common substrate preference I see is that soft, absorbable material. Especially so when it's smells- is where we sleep sometimes. <laughs> well, right. I was just going to say, especially when it smells like us, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I lied. I do want to ask one more question because it's from Malaysia. Ooh. And I think, yeah, I think that's cool. Uh, so hello from Malaysia. There are many, are there many t- times, types maybe they mean of litter materials, such as sand, crystal, wood, litter. Uh, does this affect cats littering behavior? Now, I'm going to add to that. Now you can go to the pet store, uh, in America anyway, I don't know about Malaysia, and you can see all of these things, all of these choices that are supposed to be in some cases all natural is their marketing. Or in some cases, they're, you mentioned little crystals, they're all over the house in a week, but nevertheless, do such a wide variety. Some of them are supposed to be, you could flush them down the toilet. Some of them are supposed to be uh, more nature friendly or more eco friendly. Mm-hmm. Forget about eco friendly for a second, that's important, but cat friendly, I think, is most important. So, what do you think about all of these? There are probably a hundred or more of yeah. these choices that are now available. That's a great point. And this was something we would do with vet students who were on rotation learning about behaviors. We would actually make a field trip to the pet supply store and just say, look at all these options. Like you need to know what your clients are going through when they get a cat who doesn't come with an instruction book and there's all this flashy marketing and advertisement that says, we're the best. Your cat loves this. Never smell a stinky litter box again. So people have no idea. And, um, What I say to that is think, it all goes back to that natural preference, fine, sandy texture. And in my opinion, the clumping clay litter is what meets that need the best. You wanna think about avoiding harsh perfumes because if there's a strong scent to it, cats might find it aversive. They're very attuned to to smells. Um, And so think about all those. So we've, I've had cats, they've come to me with just about every type of litter. Um, I've had the crystals be problematic because they're, they're harsh on the paws. Again, you want it to be soft, you don't want these crystals getting stuck. It doesn't feel as comfortable on their paws. I've had people use yesterday's news, which you know some people have chosen to do a declaw. This is it's not for this talk today. And they use yesterday's news, these pelleted litters that are dust free, but they're big and they're hard. And they just kind of become this sticky mess if a cat urinates on it. So while we as people may like it, it's not very appealing to the cat. You bring up the eco-friendly one. So eco-friendly, flushable, great. I actually love that idea. Some cats do great with it, but the the problem with eco-friendly is that most of them are food-based. So they're made out of corn, they're made out of wheat, they're made out of walnuts, which A, can cause mold to grow if if there's moisture getting in there, which can be a problem because your cat has asthma. And as we talked about, cats don't want to poop or pee where they're eating. Some cats will see corn and wheat and walnuts as a food. And so they're A, not going to eliminate their B, if they do eat it, it's super dangerous because it clumps and it's going to cause clumping of that substrate in their belly. It can cause a foreign body. So just think about what are the basics that cat like. Fine, sandy texture. Clumpy clay tends to be the preferred. Every cat is a unique individual. So we may have to stray beyond that. But think about it. The clumping is really nice because you can scoop it every day and it's clean. It's like that's your instant toilet flush. Whereas the others that aren't clumpable, you're going to have to toss that whole litter essentially every day, which isn't very eco-friendly if you're having to toss it out every day. Um, and it's not cat-friendly if you aren't tossing it out every day. So just some some food for thought. No, uh, so to speak. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Heron, I do want to say that the link will be sent via email within the next day to three days, uh, apparently for the what you just did. So uh, I also do want, I want to do one more thing, and that's thank Virginia uh, from the Wind Feline Foundation for her help. Uh, in putting all this together. She is amazing. Our staff is amazing. 
So Lisa, I want to also thank you. But most of all, Dr. Megan Heron, thank you so much. And thank you for your work, very hard work, uh, to put this book together available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. Uh, this was great, great comments. Thank you all very much. Thank you for attending and for your comments. I apologize that we just didn't have time. We never do to get to all the questions. Uh, but I do wish you have a good day. And far more importantly, you, what you really need, and Dr. Heron, you didn't need to talk for 50 minutes. We could have just said this. Put a sign with an arrow next to the box to say, <laughs> pee here. That's all we need. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Heron. <laughs> It's been Thank a pleasure. You. Thank you. And again, text cats to get your chance to win a copy of the book. If you don't win, it's available at almost all major retailers in the store and online. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Dr. Dr. Heron. Dr. Heron, quick yes. question. Somebody asked if the book is available in e in e format. Yes, it is available in hardback, e format, and audiobook. We will have a um, soft cover available next year. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, guys. Have a good day.